Hello and welcome to Humane Voices, the official podcast of the Humane Society of the United States. I'm Chad, alongside with my co-host Kelly. How are you, Kelly? I'm good. How are you, Chad? I'm doing well. So today we're going to talk about uh, how the pandemic changed things for your local animal shelters and rescue groups and how they're doing now. Uh, we've got a couple of real experts to talk about all things animal shelter. Uh, Lindsay Hamrick, Director of Shelter Outreach and Engagement at the Humane Society of the United States. And Stephanie Feiler, Executive Director of Shelter Animals Count, a nonprofit that collects and shares data about animals and communities. All right, let's kick it off. Yeah, I'm so I'm excited. Thank you all for being here to get into this, because this is one of those topics you know, some of the topics we cover are ones that have kind of stayed somewhat inside baseball within the animal welfare movement. And I feel like this is a topic that really did get um, pretty significant media attention, I think. So so I think this is a, a really good topic, and I'm glad that it's had a lot of, of reach. Um, so Stephanie, let's start with you before we kind of get into some of the content about this. Can you share a little bit about your organization, what you all do at Shelter Animals Count? Sure. Um, so Shelter Animals Count, we were founded in 2012. So we're a newer organization. Um, and we were founded by all of the national stakeholders, including um, Maine Society of the United States, because we knew as an industry that we needed to do a better job of actually making decisions based on data um, than maybe just how we thought or felt. And so um, there really wasn't anything of its kind at the time. Um, so Shelter Animals Count was formed to be that neutral, independent, third-party data collection agency. So we began uh, collecting data in 2016 and now just finished our seventh full year. So um, still fairly new, but we have now a lot of data that we can go to to understand what's been going on in the country. Um, and soon this year we'll be expanding into Canada as well. And you mentioned some of the the groups and folks that support this. Um, where do you get your information from? Other groups, shelters, rescues? I mean, who's providing kind of the data? Yeah, all of our data is um, provided voluntarily by shelters, government, animal control organizations, hybrid organizations between private and public and then foster-based rescue organizations. So we have over 7,000 that we've collected data from and a um, variety of organizations represented, geographical regions represented, since we know there's a lot of regional differences and seasonality to the work that we do at, in animal shelters. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we had a representative sample of all of that work. That's great, so many stakeholders. I assume that really helps broaden out your data, right? I mean, that's important to have so many 7,000. That's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it is very important to have everybody's voice because like I mentioned, there is so much regional difference and we are able to look on the national level um, in aggregate to see what's happening for trends across the country. But then we're able to drill down all the way down to region, state, county, city, and then the individual shelter as well. Um, to see where things are um, going well and where things maybe need improved. And that's where also uh, grantors look to see where are shelters and rescues that need an extra boost with maybe some mentorship or some funding. Um, so it's really, and or also where, where some organizations that have space if there's overcrowded shelters so we can move animals around. So it serves a lot of purposes, but ultimately the, the overall benefit is that we're making fact-based decisions. Yeah. Fa facts are good. We like facts. We like information. <laughs> we like data. Um, so let's talk about that specifically as it relates to animal shelters post pandemic. Um, so Lindsay, I'll, I'll pitch it to you. How are shelters but, doing after the pandemic? Shelters are not doing so great right now. Um, and I just want to add to Stephanie's great overview of shelter animals counts role in animal welfare that as a national organization, having an understanding of what's going on region to region is so critical to our efforts to figure out what is our niche in supporting shelters and rescues. And we have really utilized this data not only to understand kind of how things have ebbed and flowed the last couple of years, but also what our programs look like um, and what trainings are needed at Animal Care Expo or other avenues that we are able to support those local organizations. So. 
The bad news is that shelters are in crisis. They have been in crisis for quite a while. Um, the good news is that with the data that Shelter Animals Count can provide, we can really hone in on what are the biggest challenges, what really is happening. You all might remember we got a lot of questions after the, the sort of uh, beginning of the pandemic about whether people were kind of abandoning or dropping off the animals they had adopted in 2020. And because of the data coming out of Shelter Animals Count, we were sort of holistically able to respond to that and say, nope, that's not what's happening. What's happening is the decrease in adoptions and some other factors that Stephanie can go into detail about. Um, and that really shifts the narrative about what's going on with the public and how we can help them. And so when you say crisis, let's define that a little bit. Um, when when shelters being in crisis right now, I mean, in terms of time frame, is that just since the pandemic? And then what does crisis look like? Yeah, Stephanie, do you want to talk a little bit about 2019 compared to now? Sure. So I'll put an exclamation point on the end of what Lindsay just shared that um, the crisis really has persisted for the past couple of years. Um, if we walk back to 2019 and look at kind of a pre-pandemic, we were seeing a high number of animals entering the shelter system, which includes foster-based rescues. Um, but we were seeing overall that about the same number of animals coming into shelters by the millions um, were the same that were leaving by the end of the year. And so our populations didn't grow within the shelters. They weren't overcrowded, so to speak. Um, in 2020, we saw a huge dip in number of animals coming in. Um, so we were dealing with fewer animals in the sheltering system. And at the same time, we saw a huge increase in animals leaving um, because, as we all remember, there was a huge rally to support community shelters and get animals adopted. And that was great. We were hoping that would be our new normal in 2020. Unfortunately, that was not the case. Um, in 2021, we started to see the number of animals increase a little bit more coming in. Still nowhere near 2019 levels, a little higher in 2022, and then a little higher last year to where we're looking at finishing last year um, at or higher than we were in 2019 with the number of animals entering. But the problem is at that same time that we were increasing number of animals entering, we were decreasing or flatlining the number of animals leaving. And a lot of that was in, in part related to adoptions, particularly for dogs, adoptions have stagnated. Um, and so now we're seeing shelters are either full and having to change operation, um, are trying to make space desperately into creative and new ways, um, with, with that being a short-lived solution, um, or they're having to change their operation and maybe stop accepting animals for a period of time, or we're seeing in some cases um, organizations having to make euthanasia decisions that they haven't been faced with, with for years. And so all of that has really been a, the snowballing effect with the animals, but then you overlay that with challenging economy, staffing shortages, veterinary shortages, um, volunteer programs not returning to pre-pandemic levels, donations not returning. It's really literally everything that could break breaking at the same time. So is that, and I want to make sure to... To put a point on that, so because uh, you're right, Lindsay, the narrative for a while there was just, oh, yeah, people adopted pets and they were, you know, sending them back. Pandemic ended, they were back to work. But it really, it sounds more like from what you're saying, Stephanie, it is a perfect storm of a lot of factors. It is. And and that's the interesting thing. When we start to look into the data, um, it's important to recognize an individual shelter's experience or maybe even a state or region does not necessarily indicate a national trend. And so the headlines that we heard in, I think, early 2021 was everybody's returning back to work and pandemic pets are being surrendered in that record numbers. And that really came from one organization experiencing that. And then the headline just took off across the country. And while it that was their experience. It wasn't really replicated um, in national data. What we actually have seen is owner, owner surrenders decreasing um, in the past three years. Each year, they're steadily stepping down. Um, at the same time, we're seeing strays go up. And there's a, there's a lot of reasons surrounding why that could be happening. Um, but it really is now. When, in 2021, it was like, okay, sh some organizations, generally the ones that we typically hear from that are always struggling in the South, um, particularly, we're like, we're full. In 2022, we heard more. And now in 2023, it is literally every organization across the board. 
um, that has a building. The the foster based organizations have a little bit of flexibility because you know they they can bring in animals when they have an opening. They don't when they don't. Um, but for the brick and mortar, particularly organizations that um, whose mission or legal um, government contract obligations require them to bring in every animal, regardless of space, they're the ones that are really really struggling. So you mentioned uh, even changing operations, the way they do things day to day, shelters or maybe even rescue groups. What are some examples that you can mention that this crisis has impacted the way shelters or rescue groups are doing business? So uh, some of the practices might have been used pre-pandemic. They're not necessarily brand new, but the the level of this crisis has required them to stay on permanently. So for example, shelters might have used an appointment-based system during busy times in the past, where if unless you were in crisis as a pet owner, you might have to wait a few weeks to bring your animal in if you needed to rehome them. Now what we're seeing is appointments are, are sort of the norm, which we don't necessarily oppose that uh, that perspective, but the number of pet owners who are also in crisis and can't necessarily wait a few days or a few weeks to bring their animal in is creating this tension between community need and what the shelter can realistically offer. Um, I also think that uh, open hours have changed. So when shelters have faced this staffing shortage, they can't staff the hours that they used to. So maybe a shelter had evening or weekend hours available for folks who work uh, during the day or can't get there during the day um, in the past. And now maybe they only have one evening that you could come in either for resources or to adopt a new pet. And so some of these barriers that we've worked really hard to remove uh, towards uh, getting animals out either through adoption or returning lost pets to their families, um, those barriers have really increased. And I think that people working in shelters right now feel that tension. They don't necessarily want to have these policies in place, um, but unless their municipalities are going to fund them at a higher level or they're able to retain employees at a private organization, we're just not going to be able to get back to the level of services that they provided before. Yeah, everything Lindsay said is what we're hearing as well. Um, and we're we're hearing too that the volunteer programs have made that staffing shortage even more challenging, that there's some organizations that aren't their solution when they were full was to have these massive adoption events. Um, and now they're not even able to hold them because they don't have the, the infrastructure to support it. So um, even in situations where we could drive more adopters, sometimes there's organizations that literally don't have the, the people to make it happen. So it, it's a lot of multifaceted areas. And um, yeah, it's all happening at once. In terms of the dogs that are at shelters, I think there's this misconception, you know, people hear, oh, shelters are, are just, they're overcrowded, they're at maximum capacity, and people think, oh, it's probably one or a few types of dogs. It's mostly older dogs, or it's, and that's, I mean, is that true? We do hear that. Um, that is a misconception, especially in today's current sheltering climate. Um, we see all kinds of dogs in shelters. And we did a pulse check actually recently with some of our members because we were starting to hear that there were a lot of purebred dogs or intentional hybrids like your oodles and foos. Um, and we were starting to hear a lot about puppies um, more than usual. Uh, there was at, at the end of the pandemic, there was the thought that maybe um, if you needed to get a puppy or if you wanted to get a puppy, maybe you couldn't find it as easily as a shelter as you used to be able to a few years ago. And because of a lot of um, factors, we are seeing a lot of puppies in shelters right now. Um, we're seeing a lot of purebreds. We're seeing a lot of intentionally uh, bred hybrids. And we're seeing a lot of also our um, mixed breed dogs of unknown origin that have always existed in shelters. Um, and we're seeing a lot of big dogs too because of housing and some other factors that we can go into later. Um, but really, when we look at the the data with um, organizations like adoptapet.com, where you can go and search across the country by a certain size or breed or age or whatever, um, you can find it at a shelter and you can put in a radius and find one near your home and you can expand it if you're looking for maybe something a little more specific, a little further out. Um, but we're, there's one example of a shelter that literally has hundreds of golden doodles that they um, rescued from a puppy mill actually. 
And those dogs waited behind to get adopted, um, just like any other breed would have in the past. Um, we're seeing French bulldogs in shelters in California that are waiting to get adopted um, because people aren't coming to adopt the dogs or looking elsewhere. So really now more than ever, the adopt, don't shop or look to adopt first is so, so important. Yeah, you mentioned, so you guys, you mentioned all these different things happening all at once. And you mentioned, Stephanie, big dogs, which makes me think um, real estate, renting, like no dog policies. Is that a piece of this too? Like people uh, looking for an apartment and they've got a dog and they can't find a place to live? Yeah. So we have been doing a housing mentorship program the last couple of years. And one of the pieces of that mentorship is to really look at the animal level data. So how is housing impacting the number of animals coming into a shelter? And what we're finding is that when a shelter runs a basic report of their software, some of them report pretty high percentages of the dogs that are coming in. It's because of somebody moving, not able to find another pet-friendly rental, they're getting evicted. And others actually have reported a pretty low percentage until we've asked the right questions of the public. So one shelter reported about a 20% uh, reason for that housing was leading to the intake of animals. And then when we shifted the way they were asking the community about that challenge, it rose to about 82% of the dogs were coming in in part because of housing restrictions. So for HSUS, it is a critical uh, root cause issue that we are trying to address. And I will say, I know this conversation has been kind of doom and gloom so far, <laughs> but the positive news is that whether you're a local organization, a regional shelter coalition, or a national organization, I feel like at no other time in sheltering have so many bright, smart, talented people been working on not just the immediate issues that are happening, but the long-term uh, solutions that we're going to need so that shelters don't continue to cycle like this through periods of overcrowding and then periods where we're like, yay, we did the thing. Yeah, Lindsay's 100% right. And I'll add to that. Um, creativity, we're finding there's a lot of organizations that are coming up with short-term solutions to be able to provide crisis type house, housing for pets while their people find housing so that they can hopefully be reunited too. Um, which is the, the other thing that has really come from this is not only the need to get more animals out, but the need to help continue to keep pets with families where they belong. So there's a lot of shelters doing a lot of great work on both sides of it and um, just need the community to continue to support that work. Yeah, geez, you've given us a lot to think about here. Um, what do you guys see uh, down the road a little bit? Look into your uh, crystal ball, see what's 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 going to happen in the next year. We're at the beginning of the new year, 2024. What's what's ahead for shelters? Well, when we look at the data, um, it could really go a lot of directions. Q quarter one uh, for us, March or January through March is usually the shelter slow time. Um, across the board. And this is really the time when it can set the stage for how the rest of the year is going to go. Because as long as we can make space now um, for animals that we know will arrive in the spring and summer, we'll be able to fare that busy time so much better. Um, so if we can make that big rally to clear the shelters by the end of March, um, things will look like they can start to turn around. Um, if we don't, and we follow the same three-year trend, we're predicting another imbalance, um, now the fourth year in a row, of too many animals coming in and animals staying behind and those tough decisions having to be made um, unless we can get that turned around. So right now, if nothing were to change, not a, a, a really great outlook. However, there's so much that could happen in the next um, 60 days that could really turn that around completely. What are some of those factors, Stephanie, that could happen that could turn that around? Well, for dogs, very simply, an increase in adoptions. Um, we're seeing cat rates of adoption. So about uh, two, out of every, two out of every three, um, sometimes as high as three out of every four cats that enter a shelter are getting adopted. And there's other ways that they can leave the shelter too um, through either for cats, obviously return to field um, if they're community cats or return to owner if they're um, pets. And so that's still very, very high adoption rates for cats, which is amazing. 
uh, that was not always the case for cats. Many, not mm-hmm. even many years ago, we saw that be completely opposite. So the good news is we've done it before. We can do it again, but now we have to look at doing, keeping that and look at doing the same for dogs. Dogs really are more like half of um, about one out of every two dogs that enter, enters a shelter leaves through an adoption. And we're seeing um, that really stay, stay flat and the, the rate that they're being reclaimed once they're lost is going down. So between those two things with dogs, it, um, either increasing the adoptions and not even dramatically, dramatically would be a, make a huge impact, but even um, slightly would have a ripple effect into the millions Um, And one cage makes a difference for all the animals that can come in and out of that the rest of the year. Um, But then also increasing reuniting dogs with their owners, um, either through proactive microchipping and ID programs, or even um, just solidifying and creating a better pathway for pets to find their, or for people to find their last Mm -hmm. pets. Those two things, if those were to shift, would have a huge ripple effect on um, not only space, but a reduction in euthanasia. So you mentioned a couple things, microchipping your animals, um, obviously adopting from your local shelter. I mean, for, for listeners, what are some, some concrete things they can do to really help penetrate this crisis for not just the animals in the shelter, but I think we want to make this clear if the animals and shelters are in crisis, there are shelter professionals and animal welfare professionals um, a part of that too. So burnout. And so how can people support the crisis overall, their local shelter, um, staff members, but also, you know, impacting the animals? Yeah, I would add to Stephanie's uh, great points that one of the magical parts that we saw in 2020 was that the community helped one another. And so the more that neighbors and family members can serve as that safety net for their friends and family, the fewer animals need to come into shelters to begin with. And every time you offer to pet sit for free or, you know, your grandmother goes into the hospital and you watch her dog for her, those are making huge impacts, not just for your family and friends, but for the shelters who would ultimately be that safety net for mm-hmm. the pet. Um, I also think that whether you used to volunteer at an animal shelter or rescue or you're thinking about it, now would be the time. Um it can be difficult to go into a local organization that is in crisis and volunteer. It feels stressful. You can feel the kind of burnout that's happening among the staff, but of all times, that is exactly when they need you. And it, I think people feel like, you know, they're just going in and cleaning cages and you don't realize that that one or two hour shift that you're giving at the shelter once a week is their ability to have time to, to, approach these situations from a case management approach and look at each animal as an individual and figure out what exactly that animal or their pet owner would have needed to stay together. So it's not just cleaning cages, it's actually being part of this really holistic solution. I really like that. And I I think that is important uh, for listeners is that there is so much that you can do without exerting a lot of energy. And there's always call your local shelter and say, hey, I have resources, whatever those are, time, um, money, you know, and say, how how could I help? I am a community member. I want to help you. So there's, I appreciate that there are ways that we all can make a difference um, and hopefully start to, um, you know, change what as you said, is a crisis. So I want to thank you both so much for being here. Lindsay, our returning champion expert, and Stephanie, for the amazing work that you are doing at Shelter Animals Count. That is a public-facing website. There's a lot of great data on there for policy wonks, legislators, policymakers, data nerds, um, you know, have at it. There's lots of really great resources there. So thank you both for being with us today. And thank you listeners for being um, here with us and learning more about what you can do to make a difference in shelters. And we will catch you next time on Humane Voices. 